Please be seated and we'll have our first reading by Izzy. The first reading is from Romans chapter 3, verses 1 to 31. Then what advantage has the Jew, or what is the value of circumcision? Much in every way. For in the first place, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. What if some were unfaithful? Will their faithlessness nullify the faith, for the faithfulness of God? By no means, although everyone is a liar, let God be proved true, as it is written, so that you may be justified in your words and prevail in your judging. But if our injustice serves to confirm the justice of God, what should we say? That God is unjust to inflict wrath on us? I speak in a human way, but by no means, for then how could judge God judge the world? But if through my falsehood God's truthfulness abounds to his glory, why am I still being condemned as a sinner? And why not say, as some people slander us by saying that we say, let us do evil so that good may come, then condemnation is deserved. What then? Are we any better off? No, not at all, for we have already charged that all both Jews and Greeks are under the power of sin, as it is written, there is no one who is righteous, not even one. There is no one who has understanding. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. There is no one who shows kindness. There is not even one. Their throats are opened graves. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of vipers is under their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery are in their paths. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For no human being will be justified in his sight by deeds prescribed by the law, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. But now, irrespective of law, the righteousness of God has been disclosed and is attested by the law and the prophets, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there is no distinction since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are now justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a sacrifice of atonement by his blood, effective through faith. He did this to show his righteousness, because in his, in his divine forbearance, he had passed over the sins previously committed. It was in, to prove that the present time that he himself is righteous and that he justifies the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of boasting? It is excluded. By what law? By that of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that a person is justified by faith apart from works prescribed by the law. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also, since God is one, and he will justify the circumcised on the ground of faith and the uncircumcised through that same faith. Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Heavenly Father, we pray that you send your Holy Spirit to reveal your word to us, to reveal your truth. And in hearing it, may we rejoice for all that you have done through us. In Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 Please take a seat. <coughs> How are you enjoying Romans so far? <laughs> Dangerous question to start with. Just remember that picture of the, the mountain that we're climbing. Christopher, in his brilliant sermon last week, talks about we're going down through the valley of sin before we can begin to climb. Well, we start off still down there. 
but things are going to change. <clears throat> Usually at a social gathering or a, a party or something, people who don't really know me come up to me and ask, so, what do you do? And I say, well, I'm a vicar. And quite often I get the response, yeah, well, that's, that's interesting, and I'm not religious. And I usually say, nor am I. <laughs> Which surprises people. Surely you've got to be religious to be a vicar. And I said, what do you mean? I said, no, I'm not interested in religion. But I am interested in faith. And then hopefully that begins a, a conversation. I think all of us, if you really can pin us down, have an understanding or a view of God which says God is good. <coughs> he wants us to be good people. So therefore, by us being good, we make him happy. Or some kind of variation on that theme. Actually, the Bible does not teach that. But all other religions do. All other faiths and, and religious systems do. Whether it's in Islam keeping the five pillars of Islam, there's something that we have to do to make God happy. Whether it's if you're a Buddhist, following the noble eightfold path. Whether it's in Eastern Met in mysticism and Hinduism, building up good karma, so that the good things that we do outweigh the bad things we do. And I think all of us have a, an instinct that that's probably the right way of living. If we're honest, we all know we make mistakes. Sometimes other people spot them. Sometimes we think, oh, I hope I got away with that one. But we all are flawed. Even the best that we want to aspire to be, we don't quite achieve. And it's hard work being good. Particularly if you're driving. It's really hard being good and being charitable to other road users. Or dare I say, <coughs> cyclists. It's really hard to have a holy mindset all the time. And within that system of, of being, what's the pass mark? How much good do we need to be in order to please God? We're not going to get 100%. <coughs> so is it, are we aiming for a first? Are we going for 80%, is that what God's standard is? Or is it, so long as you're a little bit better than you are bad, so round about the 51% mark, is that enough? Or is it 50.1% enough? Trouble is we don't know how good we need to be in order to please God. so easy to have that kind of mindset. But as I said, the Bible does not teach this. Instead, the Bible is very clear to present God as being the person who's made us all and who has set standards for us to live by. The law in the Old Testament is there to show the standard of what a perfect, good, pleasing life would look like. But sacrifices were provided because it was also acknowledged that we would never fully achieve them. That we would have to shed blood in order to say sorry for the wrong things that we had done. So if God's standard is perfection 
and we can never achieve perfection. How are we ever going to get to heaven? As Jesus said to his disciples, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees and the, the scribes, unless you're most holy than the most holy people, you won't see the kingdom of heaven. How are we ever going to get in? Well, this is what Paul is writing the letter to Romans to explain. He's writing to people he's not met before to say to them that these are the foundations, these are the hallmarks of what the Christian faith is. You've got to understand that we're all in the same boat, that every single one of us is sinners, are sinners. We all mess up and we fail to live up to God's standard. So, how do we proceed? So in that big, long passage at the beginning of chapter 3, which Izzy so well read well to us, is a description of both Jews and Gentiles who are both in the same boat. That Jews have been given a clearer light of what God's standards are, but Gentiles, we still have a, a moral code which we fail to live up to. And then we reach verse 21. If you've still got the Bible in front of you, Romans chapter 3, verse 21, begins with two words. If someone would like to read out very loudly what those first two words of verse 21 are. But now. Fantastic. Thanks, Steve. Can we all say, but now? But now. But now, everything changes. The description at the beginning of Romans 1, 2, and 3 is that we all are sinners. But now. This is the turning point. From this point on, we begin to breathe a different atmosphere. Instead of focusing on sin and the evil that's within us, that can sometimes wrestle to overcome us. There is a but now. And theologians have said that the, those verses, verses 21 to 24, are the whole Bible in three verses. So we're going to reread them. But now, irrespective of law, the righteousness of God has been disclosed and is attested by the law and the prophets. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. Since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, they are now justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. But now, there is good news. But now, there is a way to heaven. But now, you don't have to strive to be good or good enough. Because God gives his goodness to us. And his goodness does surpass that of the scribes and the, and the Pharisees. He's so utterly good that when he gives his goodness to us, we're covered. And so we can enter heaven. We have eternal life through faith in Jesus. It's not through anything that we've done. No amount of attending church, reading the Bible, being baptised, going to home groups, praying and prayer meetings, no amount of pilgrimages or giving to charity, no amount of, amount of that can ever get you to heaven. But through having your trust and your faith in Jesus, he gives you the goodness that you lack. He gives you his goodness so that you are welcomed in as dearly beloved children. This is the good news of the gospel. This is what's trans transformational. And Martin Luther, when he read these words, growing up in a church context which was all about sin and trying to, to pay back 
the penalties that we'd all incurred, looking at our bank balances and seeing them constantly in the red. Martin Luther suddenly read these words and his mind completely changed. It's not through anything that I have to do. I don't have to strive to be holy. But God does it for us when we have faith. We are justified by faith in Christ. Justification is a legal term. We talk about um, being justified. It was justified that I did that. It was the right thing for me to do and it was the most appropriate and right thing for me to do. So God gives us justification, his justification. He makes us right before God and before the world as a gift because we have our faith in him. Another definition of justification is that we are just as if we'd never never sinned, that we'd never done any evil, (coughs) that our bank balance is clear, there is no debt to pay. There's nothing else required of us. It's all settled. The Battle of Borodino in 1812, when Napoleon was marching through Russia, got to the gates of Moscow, and the Russian army was formed up outside the city in a last-ditch Um, attempt to keep the the French out of Moscow. Battle of Borodino, if you've ever read War and Peace or seen the film, (coughs) is this this great set-piece battle. And the night before it happened, Tsar was walking through the army camp, visiting his officers (coughs) and encouraging them for the battle to come. He entered one tent where a young cavalry officer was staying. Opened the tent and there he was asleep on a writing desk with an empty bottle of vodka next to him. The Tsar saw that the officer had been writing something. So he bent down and saw that it was a letter home before the battle. And as the Tsar read, he learnt that this young officer had incurred huge gambling debts and that he was deeply ashamed of the dishonour that it brought to his family, and he had no means of paying what was owed. But he was going to be publicly disgraced, and his family would be disgraced because of his actions. And as a result, the letter was a suicide note. That he, The officer had determined to put himself in the, in the thick of the fighting, and that if he didn't die there, then he would die by his own hand. The Tsar bent down and wrote something across the bottom of the letter and then carried on visiting his troops. When the officer awoke, he looked at the letter that he had penned and written at the bottom was the words, paid in full, Tsar Nicholas. The emperor took it on himself to pay the young man's debts so that he would not be shamed and that he could be free of that burden. This is what Jesus does for us. He pays for our debts. He pays the price for our wrongdoing so that we're free. (coughs) Paul uses a number of words. Redemption. We are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. This idea of being paid, or of some being paid for us, to set us free. The Roman citizens that this was addressed to know exactly what redemption meant. Because if you were wealthy enough, you owned slaves. Or if you weren't wealthy enough and you were a slave, your hope would be that one day, your master or your mistress might be so satisfied with your service that they might set you free. But that could only be done by the slave price on your head being paid so that you could become a free woman or man. 
So you move from a position of slavery into citizenship. Your purpose becomes restored. Your dignity becomes restored. You are free to be a constructive member of society. No longer a slave at the back of anyone's whim or call. That's one description that Paul uses to describe what Jesus has done for us. Carry on, verse 5. God put forward Jesus as a sacrifice of atonement by his blood, effective through faith. And this is Paul writing to the Jewish readers of the letter. Because the Jewish people would know exactly what atonement was. One day a year, the most holy day of the Jewish calendar, Yom Kippur, the day of atonement, the high priest would sacrifice and would prepare himself to take the sacrifice offering through the holy place of the temple and into the holy of holies. It could only be entered once a year on this particular day. And by tradition, he had a rope carried or tied around his ankles. So that should he die and his offering not be accepted, he could be pulled back out so that nobody else would violate the Holy of Holies. But sacrifice was made to forgive the sins of the whole nation on the Day of Atonement. And Paul says that Jesus has made atonement for us through his death, through his blood shed. Everything's covered. Our sins are forgiven. We are free <coughs> if we have faith in him. So this is incredible news. The Romans were so used to making sacrifices to all these gods in the hope that the gods would take notice, might have mercy on them, might give them what they request. Christianity preaches that in Jesus, God himself sacrifices himself for us. It's not about us trying to appease God, but it's what God has done for us to rescue us, to do things for us which we could never do by ourselves to give us that restored relationship with him and with one another. God is creating a new family, a new people, set free. It's not about ever about us being worthy enough of this. <coughs> it's because God is worthy. And he counts us worthy to be part of his family. The only requirement is for us to have faith in Jesus. Jesus, I offer you my life. And I receive gladly all that you have done for me. Forgive my sins and let me follow you to the end of my days. And Paul goes on to say that therefore we've got no reason to boast. We can't say that one person is better than another. Certainly not clergy, if you look at our track record. Because we're all sinners. But we've all been redeemed through faith. There is no debt to pay. No new thing that you need to add. It's not an instalment plan. It's not a pyramid scheme. It's not a scam. But God, out of his deep love for us, laid himself down so that we can be free. John 3.16 says, God so loved the world, that's you and me, that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him will, will not perish, but will have everlasting life. So, we begin to see things a bit clearer. Romans, the atmosphere is beginning to change. There's some shafts of light coming through those dark clouds. But we needed to understand that we were all sinners before we can understand that 
God's provided a rescue plan. And the challenge is, have you put your faith in Jesus? Because you, if you have, then you are free. If it's not yet, then what is holding you back? God doesn't ask anything from you, apart from yourself. And to serve him is perfect freedom, and in him is the fullness of joy. I don't see many downsides to that proposal. Paul says that we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We're all caught up in the same problem, but God's remedy is by putting faith in him. If you want to find out more, we're starting the Alpha Course on Tuesday night. 7 o'clock, Bentley Church Hall. Meal provided. Come along. If you've got questions, it's a place where you can ask them. A chance to explore further <coughs> what this faith means. In a safe place where no question is too hostile and where you can hopefully go deeper into what God has done for us. If you'd like to come, we'd love to see you. But God does it because he loves us. He knows we can't save ourselves. In fact, he doesn't want us to even try. But he wants us to trust him. That he has made a way. It cost him everything. That doesn't cost us anything. So, we praise and we worship and we give thanks for our amazing God. And as we prepare for communion, we're reminded again of the cost to Jesus and the free gift to us. Amen. Amen.